subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. To security men, we've seen these these videos, these visuals, these photographs flashed all over our screens overnight. It's been about 36 hours. So then in the in Washington, D.C., uh, closest to the U.S. Capitol, for, you know, compared to Nafej and me, tell us what you heard, what you saw, and what people told you. Well, I mean, what I, what I heard and saw was actually not that dissimilar from you because I was quite far away from the action in a quiet and leafy part of the city, which was not invaded by uh, Trump supporters. So there were no, no flags or no guys walk, walking around with guns. But if, obviously, when you're living in the same city, it feels much closer, yeah. uh, even though I was also experiencing this uh, mostly by reading the news and by watching the uh, news channels. So, I mean, you know, we expected a certain amount of, of uh, chaos, but, uh, I, you know, I was uh, certainly taken aback by them actually successfully storming the Capitol. Um, I, I would have anticipated that the uh, security around the Capitol would have been suitably prepared and would have repelled this group because, you know, frankly, there weren't that many of them. But uh, what I was doing, you know, earlier in the day, I was watching Trump's speech. And I don't know if, 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 if both of you watched that, but it was really, you know, one of the strangest political speeches I've heard where he essentially, you know, went, you know, goaded them to take action hmm. and uh, very clearly seems to believe that the election was stolen. And many of his supporters clearly seem to believe that too. So I think even though yesterday ended, on, uh, on the right note, because the certification process went ahead and yes. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have been certified now as, as, as president and vice president who, who will be sworn in in a few short weeks. Uh, I think this larger, the drama of the Trump era, um, I, I don't think this is, a, this is a full stop. I think this is much more a comma. We're going to see more. Right. Um, Ambassador Sarna, you've been in D.C., you know the area well. But tell me, India is the world's you know, largest democracy. America is the world's oldest democracy. We've talked about this so often, it's almost become a cliche. How do you see it as an Indian and as a former diplomat who served in the U.S.? Well, honestly, it's quite shocking because, uh, you know, we, you expect a certain amount of uh, chaos in a democracy. Um, I've lived in another uh, democracy, which is Israel. Mm -hmm. And we always used to say that India and Israel are two great uh, democracies when they're so equally chaotic. Right. Uh, but there's something in, in, in the United States which, you know, used to be uh, their, their, their democracy was actually worn on their sleeve. Mm -hmm. and, and the democratic institutions, uh, the democratic traditions, the transition of power, the process of election uh, is, is so, uh, so detailed. Um, it's almost overwrought. You know, the campaign, you know, the pro election process goes on through almost two years. Uh, in that uh, sort of situation, to see something like this happening, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I wouldn't have bet any money on it if somebody had told me even five years ago uh, that this thing was going to happen. At the same time, I must say that, uh, uh, you know, now that we look back uh, over the last four years, a lot of what Donald Trump uh, was, was leading up to something like this. Huh. You know, he, he tore apart uh, the democratic uh, fabric. He, he scoffed at uh, tradition. He, he was uh, whimsical uh, in terms of, uh, you know, processes. He brought in his family very much in, into the White House. Uh, and, and he really rode roughshod over a lot of things, basically riding on creating division, on stoking uh, racism, um, on, on, you know, he, he took the civility uh, out of uh, American politics. But would you describe this as a civil war or as an insurrection? You know, words are being used in these last uh, few hours, Sadhanand. How do you how do you describe it? This is so unusual, you know, for us to see something like this in the in the free world, as it were. You know, America sort of always is so proud of of the fact that it's the leader of the free world, and here it is. Even in Bihar, we would not do something like this. You know. 
Look, I think, you know, because the, you know, these images are so fresh, some of the reactions are naturally going to be overwrought. People are tossing around words like coup and so on. Um, what I see it as is, you know, it's, it's an unruly moment. It's certainly the, the symbolism of it is, is, it should not be minimized. It certainly looks very bad for the uh, U.S. That, that, the, that the capital was invaded by this lawless mob. Um, but I also think we shouldn't, you know, overplay the significance. I mean, the fact is that it was cleared out very quickly. Um, and what we're dealing with really is, uh, is, is I mean, the, qu the question that we have to grapple with is that to what degree is this an anomaly that we can trace to the peculiar character of Donald Trump, hmm. who I think most of us can agree is an outlier in terms of uh, U.S. politics, Mm -hmm. And how much of this reflects deeper stresses and strains in American democracy that are going to continue to play out over the next few years. And I think that's, um, that's not something anyone can answer right now, but that's what I would be paying attention to. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if, this, if this is an aberration, if you want to look at it in an optimistic way, you can say that, look, the, the U.S. has very strong institutions. Those institutions have been battered. Hmm. Uh, this was probably the most visible sign of that battering. Hmm. But in the end, the institutions have survived. Hmm. The free press has survived. Ju ju the judiciary has survived. Ju you know, uh, Trump filed roughly 60 lawsuits, hmm. lost them all. Uh, it didn't matter whether the judges were appointed by Democrats or Republicans. Hmm. And even the party, and this is actually the most remarkable part, even the party, even though the Republican Party has largely surrendered to Trump, yeah. Uh, we saw many state level officials, many, many rungs below Trump, uh, willing to stand by principle. We saw this in Georgia. We saw this in Arizona. We saw this in, in Pennsylvania. We saw this in other states. So in many ways, you can say that Trump and the populist right, they have thrown everything at the system. Hmm. The system has survived. So I think it's a good news story in that sense for democracy and for America. What do you think, Navtej? Has the system survived? Do you think it will survive? And how would you... I, yeah. yeah. I would like to, you know, I, 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 I agree with a lot of what Sadhanan said, but I differ on the first point. Mm -hmm. uh, I, yeah, I think the words being used are very important and they're being used by very respectable people, including Joe Biden. Uh -huh. He called it, uh, you know, almost sedition. I think that's what yeah. he called it, insurrection. The words are being used very advisedly. So I would not dismiss this as one, you know, law and order breakdown. Mm -hmm. you know? Uh, this is a serious, is far more serious because it was, it was carried out by the president himself. Right. I mean, let's not forget it. He was the author of what happened today. He, if for a week, he was telling people, come here, come on January 6th, it's going to be wild. And then he, today, if you listen to that speech, he told them, go, I will be with you. Don't show weakness, show strength. I mean, it doesn't get you know, worse than this. So, uh, it, so this was far more than just miscreants. Uh, on the other aspects, I, I agree with uh, Sadhanan because I think today the democ democratic setup, the uh, democracy in US looks dented and battered. Hmm. But essentially, again, we have uh, green shoots, if, if, if nothing else. You know, uh, I, don't, I don't put much uh, thing on the Republicans because, frankly, they use Trump and Trump used them. Hmm. You know, Mitch, Mitch McConnell got 220 judges inside, Republican judges into the system by playing along with Trump, including three in the Supreme Court who will have a life tenure. So he did long-term uh, work for the Republicans during these years. So they all used Trump. They played Trump. Ted Cruz was using him even now, hmm. hoping for the, his presidential chance uh, later. They don't want to lose the Trump base. But the democratic traditions are strong. The hmm. systems, um, you know, the, the wellsprings of the system are, are strong. Uh, you have the junior officials, you have the media, uh, and ultimately you have uh, people who, who turn on their conscience, hmm. you know, who speak on the basis of their conscience and not for self-interest. So yes, that is what is good. It's under serious challenge. 
because I don't think it's going to repair in a hurry. So even if, you know, as Nate is talking about this divided country, but Sadanand, I mean, India knows Trump well, you know, for the last four years since he's been president. You saw yourself in Houston when uh, Prime Minister Modi, and by the way, Prime Minister Modi has tweeted today where he has said that he's very distressed at what happened and that the transfer of power should have been peaceful and should, you know, and should be peaceful and that people should have accept the verdict and obviously indicating that what's happening is wrong. But when Prime Minister Modi says, Ab ki bar Trump sarkar, how, did, how do you look at this now, two years later? Look, I think that there was an element of, uh, shall we say, diplomatic gauchery uh, in, uh, the, in the Modi government's approach to the Trump administration. And I'm not just saying it because I'm on air with the Ambassador Sarna, but most of this happened uh, over the latter half of the Trump, or, or of, the, of the Trump administration. Uh, that, that line, no matter how uh, the Modi government may want to downplay it or you know, try to be clever about what he meant, it was un unnecessary and it was unfortunate. It was a gamble. Maybe if the gamble had paid off and Trump had come back, they would have been able, they would have patted themselves on the back. Mm. Um, I, I look at that as poor diplomatic practice. Someone should have told him not to say that. He should not have said that. Hmm. Similarly, I think this kind of this attempt to grapple with this larger populist movement, right? We had that tweet with uh, Steve Bannon when he was invited to the Indian embassy by the, by, the, by the ambassador and sort of talking about him as a great dharma warrior. And then that also had to be deleted. And yeah. so I think these are definitely mishaps and it's perfectly fine for us as commentators to point these out as mishaps and to be critical. Yeah, but uh, you know, in the end, I don't think that these are these little gaucheries or little mishaps here and there are going to determine the course of uh, a very important relationship. The Biden team is staffed by very seasoned professionals, hmm. um, and they understand that the U.S.-India relationship uh, is very important. They have much bigger fish to fry. We have the rise of China, of, of China in the Indo-Pacific. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, the, the, the pandemic, which continues to rage. There's the task of economic reconstruction. And frankly, there's a legacy of the Trump years, which no matter who is in power, will have to have to deal with on two central questions, trade and immigration. Hmm. And so the Biden administration is going to have its hands full. I don't think they're going to spend a lot of time looking in the rearview mirror. Um, I do think that the Modi administration has made a mistake in terms of damaging some of the bipartisan consensus that we've seen hmm. uh, over the past 30 years in Congress, yeah. where yeah. there was a very strong, you know, um, I, I don't think that has gone away. But yeah. I think that some of that was unnecessarily damaged by, 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 things, like the, uh, by, by, by things like overplaying the relationship with Trump. But um, I think on the whole, the relationship is going to be driven by uh, shared interests. And I think we're going to get back on track. So I'm not, I'm not overly worried. So Navdeh, you know, this bipartisan co consensus that Sadhanand is talking about and that you promoted, uh, you know, people like yourselves, ambassadors of India to the US have promoted. Uh, we've seen this from not even, I'm not even talking about the Indo-US nuclear deal, but before and after. Now, some would say that this was frayed a bit by this lineup key by Trump Sarkar, even if you were to say that, you know, this is who you're dealing with. But, you know, you had external affairs minister Jay Shankar go to the U.S., cancel a meeting at the Foreign Relations Committee because Pramila Jaipal was critical of the Kashmir, um, uh, you know, revocation of Article 370. Now, is this India being uh, overly sensitive or thin skinned or are we just protecting um, our national interest? A couple of things, uh, Jyoti, here. I, I think, firstly, the bipartisan um, sort of consensus or the upward bipartisan graph in the relationship is now at least 20 years old. Huh. I mean, we have personally seen it from uh, Bill Clinton's days and his visit and Vajpayee's visits uh, uh, to the US, which, which really set off that and the Strobe Talbot just one yes. same dialogue, which. Sure. So, yeah. This has gone through Bush, it's gone through Obama, it's gone through Trump. Okay, and uh, you know, without getting into the specifics of the incidents that you, that you mentioned, uh, you know, we I was there for the first two years, so I can speak for that. Yeah, I think we 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 had to get into Trump because he was the president of the United States. Hmm. 
and 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 i must say that he was we you know we, the world realized every country dealt with him differently germany japan korea so we also had to deal with some and i must say that we dealt with him with some amount of success because he we realized his personality we realized his transactionalism we realized what he wanted and today if you actually put pen on paper and put the plus and minus there yes we had a problem with immigration more in perception than in reality we had a real problem in trade hmm. but we had very heavy pluses on the strategic security side right and we got that done uh, in in the last 4 years so, so i think i think this bipartisan consensus which you which is very important for the us is built through several things and it it may be frayed at times it may look uh, you know uh, hurt by one incident or the other but i think ultimately its roots lie in things like the people to people on hmm. the strength of the indian diaspora on what the congressmen need from the indian american community on on a lot of other things so i think there will the indian diplomatic system and the people who lead it and the people who staff it have enough flexibility to turn with this tide but you know i was really yeah, yeah, sure, sure go ahead sorry yeah they will they will manage it it's a question of tweaking the nuances it's not going to be a major change because it's it, so fascinating logic is the same uh, is the basis is the strategic logic of the relationship what us needs from india what india needs from us how we can be of use to each other that's what governs this relationship the, and it's a question of you want to pull you know on human rights a bit more or you want to pull trade on you a bit more or you want to put on security or china so it's a question of tweaking the nuances but it was so interesting you know that the way india flattered trump right sadanand you know you really schmoozed him you laid out the red carpet i mean he loved it you know you he went to the emdabad was the the first big reception where you had like thousands of people you know in in a stadium in that cricket stadium then they were flown to the taj mahal i mean you couldn't lay out a red it, it reminded me actually of the good old days when the soviets used to come to town you know then you had all these sort of kids on the streets waving their their little flags but now that trump is over or do you think he's over sadanand or is it that trumpism will remain that the other republicans will will um, will sort of you know jhado de palla as it were and say ki acha we don't want this guy anymore but we want to we want the conservative virtues of the republican party to 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 be still to be strong so there are two separate questions there look i actually think that some of the you know the red carpet and the flattery and all of that actually skillful diplomacy yeah so my criticism is limited to you know what i where where i think it overstepped the line hmm. right so there there are there are sort of places where the line was crossed that should not have been crossed like i do think that when you're you're dealing with the most powerful person in the world you're dealing with the president of the united states if you have the capacity to charm him you of course should try and charm him and, and different countries have tried to do it in different ways yeah. and uh, i think that the the thinking in 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 delhi was that you know you you'll use a certain amount of pageantry sheer numbers appeal to his vanity and so on nothing yeah. wrong with that in fact i would say that you know well you know job well done up to a point right um but beyond where 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 that kind of shaded into Hmm. uh what appeared to be overt partisanship in the us domestic political process that was noticed i think that part was unfortunate but i'm not going to condemn the whole thing the first okay. part i uh, i don't think that we've seen the last of trump now there are two different ways to look at this there's the element of trump himself his personality whether the party is going to remain hitched to him it we'll have to see how popular he remains we'll have to see what happens for example let's just say hypothetically he's removed from twitter and facebook which is possible right now he's only been muted does trump you know does does trump cease to be trump when you take away his megaphone that will mm -hmm. be something that will be very interesting to watch it will be very interesting to see how people feel about him when he is no longer able to portray himself as a winner when he said a lot of republicans him. including people That's, in his own uh, administration have resigned matt pottinger the deputy and is saying yeah but there's a lot of support there were almost 150 i think 150 odd members of congress who of, of members of the house not that many in the senate but members of the house who uh, who basically backed this uh, call of 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 trump to sort of you know dispute the election 
yeah. uh, his approval rating in the Republican Party is sky high, um, in part because many moderates and many other older style Republicans have peeled away in the Trump years. But no, what but has not, remained, no, not, not after this incident. We don't know. We don't know that, Jyoti. So but there is no... People have quit, like, you know, his own... Yeah, but there's no evidence that he has lost... I mean, there is no evidence today that he has lost the support of the rank and file of the Republican Party. We have no evidence for that. Let's see what, whether that's true in a week or a month. But you can't go based on Matt Pottinger resigning or Lindsey Graham saying something. I mean, right. in the end, if Trump retains his lock on that base mm-hmm. or on a substantial part of that base, he is going to remain a player. So that's the Trump part. But right. the more so what is lasting um, is that I think the conversations in this country hmm. around, uh, around race, around trade, around immigration, um, those are not going away. Hmm. So those, you know, those elements of Trumpism, that runs deep. You can't just sort of dismiss nearly 75 million people who voted for him and say that, you know, these guys are all you know, some of the crazy yahoos we saw in the Capitol yesterday. Right. Some of them are those crazy yahoos and some of them are just ordinary Americans who feel for whatever reason um, that they, things haven't worked out the way they've wanted them to work out. They're concerned about the trajectory of their country. Yeah. That does not go away, right? Uh, just because Biden won the presidency and just because the Democrats have 50 seats in the Senate and the control of the House, it doesn't end, uh, it doesn't end politics. It doesn't end the deep divisions in society. And so the, the hope would be, my hope would be that uh, Trump basically is discredited enough so that his own personal sort of corrosive personality hmm. ceases to dominate the Republican Party. But I'm not in a position to say today that that is necessarily going to be the future. We'll have to wait and watch. So, Navtej, what's the message now uh, to the rest of the world? This incident, even if Sadanand says they're not all crazies or all yahoos, certainly a few hundred people, you know, marching through the capital. I mean, four people have died, so they used guns. Uh, you know, in India, the last time I think you heard bullets in the parliament was on December 13, 2001, when you know, sort of Pakistanis um motivated indians to storm the indian uh, to storm the lok sabha the parliament so something like this w- is obviously going to resonate across the world and will uh, have an impact on america's reputation do you think what what does this do to america i think it's it, it a message to people you know to people like us middle countries i i i, I frankly think it's already had an impact on america's image all all over the world uh, and it's been it's it's badly dented, and you can see it if you you know watch it on uh, Russian television or you see the Chinese websites and the Chinese news. The way they are showing what is happening is really you know like okay, here's where the chickens come to roost, hmm. you know? and so they are having a gleeful moment at the moment at, at, at present. Uh, so I think it's done uh, as America as a leader. Of the of the world, or even of the so-called free world, as yeah. we used to it used to be called, uh, is 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 in retreat. And it's not only yesterday's events. Uh, I think Trump has actually engineered that. And he, you know, what he said, uh, uh, "America first was actually translated as "America alone." Hmm. You know. So uh, he withdrew, for instance, from, uh, you know, UN organizations, he withdrew from uh, trade pacts, he, he dissed his uh, allies, even, you know, the most difficult visits of the Trump, which we watched very closely before Prime Minister Modi was uh, in, in Washington, were visits yeah. of Angela Merkel and uh, Theresa May and, you know, and the Japanese. He had them hopping mad. So they lost a lot of friends, they lost the leadership role. Uh, they wanted to uh, uh, go back home, uh, literally and metaphorically, in, in many ways. And, and that has already damaged uh, America's leadership role. Today or yesterday, they, their credibility uh, uh, has, been, has been damaged. And that credibility is what will have to be uh, recreated. But 
having said that, the message to the rest of the world is that the U.S. still remains a very, very important country. The U.S. is a country which you have to have a good relationship with. The U.S. is a very rich country. It's a very powerful country militarily, economically, and it will recover. Uh, and to a large extent, it will recover. But yes, it, 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 you know, to see it as the shining city on the hill, I'm afraid we're going to have a difficult time for a while. So, Sadhanand, you know, it, we talked about, uh, Navtej talked about China, and they must be crowing that this is what's happening to a declining power. And America's in decline, there's no question. So, what do you do with the, you know, you were, the Americans were supposed to sort of balance this rising power in the East, and, and India knows China so well. We've been uh, facing off against, the, against PLA troops for the last seven, eight months. So, this makes the world... Of course, much more complicated, but also I'm talking specifically about India. You have a rising power in the East. You have a declining America, and this incident has underlined that decline. So, look, there's no question that the optics have been very bad, and there's no question that uh, America has been in a sort of inward-looking moment. Um, and quite apart from the events on capital, frankly, the other thing that many people around the world have looked to has been the chaotic handling of the pandemic. Yeah. Where again, that has also certainly, you know, hurt America's reputation for really being on the cutting edge of many of these things, right? CDC was regarded as the gold standard. Right. Um, and now we've seen that sort of it. So, so I'm, not, I'm, I'm not sort of, you know, taking away from any of those points. But I just want to point out that, you know, historically, these things ebb and flow. You know, mm -hmm. if we'd been having a conversation in 1979 where America had been uh, humiliated by the hostage crisis in Iran, the failure to rescue them, helicopters crashing in the desert, you had uh, stagflation, you had, uh, you know, the, you had long lines at, 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 at petrol pumps, you had just a sense of uh, malaise, uh, you had the defeat in the Vietnam War that had just happened a few years earlier, You'd had the impeachment of, uh, of uh, Nixon. You'd had Watergate, the rot in the domestic political system. If you had added all that together and had this conversation in 1979, and in fact, many people did make that point, it was exactly this point that, oh, you know, America is finished and, and America is in decline. And you fast forward just 12 years later, and America has triumphed in the Cold War, and it has uh, successfully beaten back Saddam Hussein in Iraq, uh, it's a unipolar moment. So all I'm saying is that these things, you know, we, we've seen such moments before. If you take the long view of history, hmm. um, I think that the system has shown an enormous amount of resilience. Um, I'm not saying that this is a guarantee that that is going to sort of, you know, continue for the next 100 or 200 years. But all I'm saying is that uh, if, you, if, you, if you take the longer view, I think the capacity to organize a society and organize an, an economy, preserve personal liberties while also generating prosperity. I, I, I think that there really is no parallel, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, it would be foolish to write that off or to read too much into the success of the Chinese experiment, which, you know, there's no doubt that the Chinese have done, you know, enormous things, both in terms of the economy and in terms of technology, military modernization and so on. But the Chinese experiment is 40 years old. I mean, how you, this, I mean, basically before the rise of Deng Xiaoping, I mean, the mm. country was completely, I mean, you think the Capitol Hill stuff was chaos? What was happening with Mao? What was happening with the Cultural Revolution? <laughs> what was happening with, so the China... Surely you're not comparing the Americans with Mao. No, I'm just Revolution. saying that let's not get carried away in comparisons between China and the United States based on the 40 best years of mm. chi modern Chinese history. And let's not compare that with, you know, a, a, a terrible couple of years in the US. Uh, I, I think that there's, there's, a, there's a much longer time frame that we should be looking at. Right. And my bet personally uh, would be that on the democratic system, because it produces very flawed leaders like Trump, no doubt. Huh. But it also gives you the means to kick them out. What happens when China gets a flawed leader? You're well, just stuck with them, right? Well, and the so, leader so, is, is going to be, uh, you know, he's going to be president forever. But last question. So, right, exactly. Yeah. So, right, what, so, so the, this, this, this issue, which is central to the Chinese problem, which is the bad emperor problem, 
which kind of goes back even beyond, you know, before the advent of communism. Um, yes, we had a bad emperor or a mad king for the last four years in the United States. But guess what? He's been kicked out. And I think that is the strength of democracy. So I would not bet against it. Well, we certainly hope so. But last question to you, Nafej, and perhaps this is a repeat, but sitting here in New Delhi, you know, you, India, Indian troops and Chinese troops are facing off uh, in Ladakh for the last seven, eight months. Um, did, do you think that India put too many of its eggs in the American basket, perhaps ignoring the other big powers like Russia? We've seen the European Union has just cut a, a trade deal with China. So I'm just wondering how, what, what, you know, what options India has. Well, I think, uh, Jyoti, you know this as well as I do, having seen India's foreign policy for so many years. Uh, we have a different problem with China than the European Union has. And uh, I think we are um, uh, often accused of not putting too many eggs in any basket. You know, we like to distribute the eggs. So, uh, you know, I think we have been very careful of that, almost to a point of fault. Uh, for instance, if you think being with the Quad is, uh, you know, putting an, too many eggs in the American basket and getting Australia to join in also in the Quad, uh, if you listen to uh, the think tanks and commentators in America, you will always find accusations that India is too slow in the court. Hmm. You're too cautious. Right. And why are you buying Russian equipment? You know, if you are our friends, then only buy our equipment. But yeah. we don't. So we, I think, are very, very, very much aware historically uh, that is the that is in the DNA of uh, our foreign policy thinkers. That, you know, you can't be in an alliance, you can't be overly loaded, whether we call it non-alignment or we don't call it non-alignment. Or strategic we, autonomy or whatever. We call it strategic autonomy, we, whatever. We, but we are very, 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 very focused on that. And I don't think it has changed. Yes, there is a marginal change. There's a marginal change because we have a bigger China problem today than maybe when we had a year or two years ago. Yeah. So there is a clearly a marginal change. And here there was a strategic convergence. Hmm. Uh, in American thinking on China, our thinking on China, the Indo-Pacific, uh, uh, entire construct of the Indo-Pacific, our movement in what I mentioned a bit earlier, our strategic uh, gains with the United States are, are signing the more foundational agreements, uh, more uh, interoperability, more exercises together. Yes, these are all these all work for us. Uh, in in the in in face of China, and I think uh, I think that's probably the way we'll carry on. Uh, and I'm sure there is nothing has changed on the ground uh, for the United States to think otherwise, unless there is a major revision in their policy on China, mm. which at the moment doesn't seem to be happening. There will be a change in uh, approach, but whether it will translate into a major change on the ground. Uh, I wouldn't think so, but we'll have to wait and see. Well, fascinating stuff. Thank you so much uh, for your time, both of you. Ambassador Naftej Sarna in Delhi, Sadan and Dhume in Washington, D.C. Thank you for participating in the print debates. Good night. Thanks, thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you.